All right, good evening, church family. Glad to be with you on this Wednesday night. So we've been walking through a series on Wednesdays where we've been looking at pride. What is so awful about pride? So a a quick reset to get you in the mind of where we're going tonight. We've been walking through, we began with the vertical path about how God is our creator and we are dependent beings, right? He is the eternal one who made us, made us in his image for relationship with him. He is the holy king, but we have determined that we want to declare our own truths. And he is the, uh, he is the loving husband or the loving father who pursues us, who has sent his son for us, that we might find our identity our purpose, our fulfillment, everything in him. But pride has caused us to step outside of his authority, underneath his umbrella, and to determine things for ourselves, okay? And uh, so we've walked through that path, but the reality is because we've stepped out from underneath uh, his identity for us and finding our everything in him, we find ourselves insufficient. And uh, it begins to cause problems on the horizontal level. Uh, The first thing that we do is we try and find other things to fill that God-sized void inside of us, all right? So for the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing on the horizontal level. All right, well, Last week we began this, and tonight we're going to complete it, but in Luke chapter 18, Scripture will be on the screen, but in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, Jesus told a parable where he is specifically talking about pride. So listen to what it says, beginning in verse 9. Now he, so Jesus, told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. So at the beginning of the parable, he tells you, this is what this parable is about. Two men (coughs) went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. But the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, okay, completely different from the Pharisee, was standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this second man went to his house justified rather than the first. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, so last week we read through that parable and we focused on the first thing. Those who were trusting in their own righteousness. And I gave this picture of uh, kind of in our minds, the, the Pharisee has this grouping. He is right next to God. Sure, God is holy and, and like he's better than me, right? But, you know, it's pretty close. And that, that tax collector, that sinner is way over there and he's all chummy. Hey, God, I sure am glad that I'm not like that guy. So, Jesus told the parable to talk about how we trust in our own righteousness. That's what we covered uh, last week. So this week, I want us to focus on the second part that Jesus said. The reason he told this was because it simultaneously, pride causes us to view others with contempt, Look at the way he views others, views others with contempt. Thank you, God, 
that I am not like other people. You broke the mold when you made me. Woo! You did good. Thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and and that I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that guy. And again, Jesus tells us, right, that we, so not only does he have an inflated view of himself, right? Remember, he's right next to God, okay? That's delusional, okay? That's that's where we were last week. In reality, yeah, you may not be quite as bad of a sinner. You can find people that are worse sinners than you, but the reality is, is God is infinitely more holy. You are delusional if you think you're that that close to God's holiness and, and that other person is It's not right next to you, okay? So it's an inflated view of self, but this other aspect, to devalue. Pride causes us to look at others with contempt. Number one, as if we are in a place to make a judgment. As if we are in a place that We should be the ones determining this, right? Like, do you have eternal perspective? Have you surveyed all the knowledge that there is and you have determined you were up here and everyone else is down here? Do you see how delusional that is? And God speaks to this. Jesus speaks to this. He says, listen, I don't know why you judge because you have a stinking log in your eye and you don't even realize it. You should really get that out before you go around and try and take a speck out of someone else's eye. We've addressed this. That is the work of the Spirit of God in your life. The mark of a touring Christian is the understanding of his or her own sin and the way that God works on our heart. You you know what happens? The more you walk with Jesus, the more you become, the more you understand the depth of your own sin and the more heinous you see like this parable is and the more you realize God is the one who judges God is the one who interprets hearts. That is not my job, right? As if I am in the perspective to look at a tax collector and to determine his heart or his circumstance, okay? Leave that to the Lord. Remember in the Old Testament, remember the first king of Israel? Saul. And why was everyone so excited that Saul was king? Yeah, uh, one, because he was handsome, and he was a head taller than everyone else, and he was, that's the kind of guy we need for a king, right? That's the kind of guy that gets everyone charged up. It gets the ladies fainting, and the men like, yeah, I want to be manly like Saul, okay? That's the kind of guy we need in charge. What was the problem with him? His heart was far from the Lord. He was disobedient. He did not walk with God. And then, do you remember uh, Samuel's selection of David? Remember when he came to the house of Jesse? Jesse had seven sons, okay? And he brought each of his sons before Samuel. And the Lord said, no, not this one. And the Lord said, no, not this one. We got to the end, and God kept saying no. What was the problem? The youngest Kind of the mutt was out back tending the sheep in the interim. Jesse didn't even bother to bring him for. And what does God say to Samuel? Do not judge according to man's standards. God judges the heart. God is the one who sees and understands. This one loves, he loves me with his heart. He is the one that I have chosen. One who loves him with his whole heart. Okay? God's perspective is completely different. How delusional it is to look at a tax collector, okay, and say, at least I'm not that guy. Do you remember what Jesus said to Zacchaeus? 
Remember, everyone thought that uh, this is exactly how you should have treated Zacchaeus, like this parable, okay? He, he was crawled up in the sycamore tree, and then Jesus said what? I'm coming to your house. Come down, I'm coming to your house. And everyone was floored. Why? <clears throat> you can't go to his house? Not only because he's short and probably bald, You can't go to his house. He's a sinner. You can't do that. The kingdom of God has come to you today, Zacchaeus, right? God looks so differently. But number two, why are we comparing? When you pay attention to this parable, the guy feels better about himself Because he has looked around and found someone that he's like, I am better than. Okay? And he feels good about himself. By the way, his own interpretation, it is he's very easy on himself and very hard on someone else. And then he feels so good about himself. But as you read the account you realize he actually cares nothing about God. He's in the temple and he's praying not to God, to himself. And he's delusional the whole time. Thank you, God, that I am better than others. And he doesn't at all care what God thinks. In fact, he assumes Well, I'm sure God thinks I'm as great as I do. That's what he says. Because I've found someone that I'm better than. Why are we comparing? Why do you allow it to steal so much joy? A couple quick biblical examples and I'm done. Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4. In that story, Cain does not bring an offering worthy to the Lord. And God says, Cain, why is your countenance fell? If you do good and you do what is right, then you will be encouraged. If you fix this, Cain, then you will be encouraged. What does Cain do instead? He kills his brother. Why? Because he was jealous that his brother brought a good offering. So instead of fixing this, he said, you know what I'm going to do? Kill that guy. And you see how evil it is. Second example, John chapter 21, the very end of John's gospel. Remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times. After The night of of the Last Supper, looking Jesus in the eye and saying, listen, I know all those other guys are going to fail you, but not me. There ain't no way I'm failing you. I will die for you. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times tonight. So Peter does. Peter's heartbroken. He's destroyed. So in John chapter 21, Jesus mercifully, compassionately restores him. Asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I do. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Uh, Tend my lambs. Be a shepherd to my people. Three times he asks him. And on the third time, Peter is heartbroken because he remembers that he called down curses upon his head. And at the end of that, Jesus says, you follow me now. But in that, Jesus tells Peter, he said, when you were younger, you used to go wherever you wanted to go. But in the end, you're going to be bound. And you're going to follow me all the way to your death. Now, Peter has just, uh, he's just witnessed Jesus' example of death. 
and he's just been restored, okay? But he looks right next to him and says, well, what about John? What about John? Jesus' reply, what is that to you? If I want him to live until I come back, what is that to you? You see, it was moving and powerful and, and engaging and life-giving when Peter was restored to ministry and told, tend my sheep. But how quickly he was like, oh, yeah, it's great that you restored me. I mean, I know I denied you and all of that stuff. I had the weight of death upon me and I've been sulking for, you know, 40 days now and all of that. But it's great that you restored me. What about that guy? Do you see how quickly comparison steals our joy? Steals our joy. And you and I are no different. I got to close. I'm going over time. Sorry. You and I are no different. There's a particular time in my own life, back in my last church, I was happy as can be. I mean, just content. I was driving home, just content. Oh, God, you're, I'm just so content in all the ways. And then I read on Facebook that a good friend of mine from seminary had, was making a move to a giant church in Oklahoma. And you know what begins to take place in my heart? Well, this place stinks. I can't believe God's wasting me here in this town. What did he do to get that big giant church and get such a promotion and all that other stuff? And the Spirit of God slammed me in that moment. What is it to you? Whatever I do over here, You were completely content just five minutes ago in all that I have given you. What is it to you if I bless someone over here? It's pride. It's a deficiency within us. Do you really trust God? Stop comparing, turning sideways. Look up, fix this in the depth of your soul. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its potency. Forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for the times that we do not fix our eyes upon you and we wander in comparison, always, always undermining other people, being overly favorable and generous to ourselves and acting as if you do not have our best interest in mind. Father, we trust you. I trust you with my life. If you discipline me, I need it. If you are correcting me, I need it. I need to be shaped into your image. And I trust that you are going to do what you see fit with your other children and I don't need to worry about it unless you call me specifically in a situation to remove the speck out of their eye. Help us to live like this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.